Have you been feeling like your life could be better in some nondescript way? Well then you should sign up for the Mockers Patreon. Benefits include early access to feature videos, occasional bonuses, plus an opportunity to make easy cash. For every person you sign up to the Patreon, you'll receive a dollar of their pledge. And 50 cents from the pledges of people they sign up. That means if you sign up, just n not not that many people probably, then you'll make like millions of dollars and all of the people who were mean to you in high school will feel really stupid, so don't think, act now. Everything just stated about profit opportunities was purely satire. The Marcus Patreon works like any other and will not actually generate income of any kind. Enjoy the video. I have a lot of questions for you. Even though I've been your student for years and I get to spend all this time with you, I feel like there's always such a wealth that I can... But when you have the opportunity to s put a bright light on me and just question me, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. What right. the hey? I have to take advantage. We're going to begin today's video with an exercise. If you already know who Keith Raniere and Alison Mack are, you'll absolutely be able to participate in the same way as someone who's coming in completely cold. But if you've never heard of these people, all the better, so don't look them up. The exercise is simple. Literally all that we're asking for is your attention. So if you're currently consuming this video in a passive manner, listening to it in the background, watching it while playing with your phone or what have you, cut that out. At least just for this short exercise. In a moment, we'll resume playing this conversation for three minutes, and all we're asking you to do is to pay as close attention to it as you can. We're not telling you to look for anything in particular, it's just important that you're not in a position to say, I wasn't paying attention, when we pause again and give you the second and final instruction of the exercise. I know for myself there are moments in time when I feel like mm -hmm. creatively abound, and then there are other times when I just feel like a, the most boring person on the planet, I can't come up with anything. Mm. And I was just wondering if you could explain sort of your take on the nature of creativity and if there's a process of I could say a bunch it? of things that are just not creating creativity. Creating creativity. There's a creative yeah. or act. Or is it like a muscle that you or can Or a scientific build? act. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I normally speak of science and creativity as sort of being somewhat opposite, but they're, they're not real. I mean, inherent in science is this notion that we can have free will, and there's even in science things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that, that talks about our limits and how we can observe things. and. Stuff like that. But, uh, you know, a point is, if we have something that we can predict, it becomes not creative at all. It has no free will. And it's science. And if it seems to have free will, we see it as things, things parts of it that are not predictable and thereby creative. It creates. It is the thing that comes from it is not a function of that which comes before mm -hmm. in any way that we can predict. It's as if this thing birthed something totally new and unpredictable. Mm -hmm. If it's predictable, it's not creative. Right. <clears throat> so, of course, we as humans feel we have free will and that's sort of interesting, but it doesn't mean we do. It just means we can't see our own programming enough to say that we're just robots. You know, if it ever comes about that we find that we are truly just robots, uh, automata of sorts, um, I think all creativity is out the window then. Totally, because that's just pre-programmed into you. Yeah, so that which makes us not a scientific um, predictable thing is creativity. Now most people take creativity and, you know, they... Unfortunately, creativity in itself has a more rigorous or, uh, I would say, pure aspect. And then, as with many things, and we as humans love to do this, use it as an excuse. Um, you know, I, I, there's a, a saying that talent, it's by Schopenhauer, talent hits the target no one else can see. Uh, I mean, no one else can hit. And genius hits the target no one else can see. So whenever I hit my volleyball, I serve my volleyball off of the court completely, it's just genius. <laughs> All right, so now that you've listened to this conversation for three minutes, though it may have felt significantly longer, 
Here is the final instruction for the exercise. Imagine as you've been watching, a friend has noticed you paying close attention to this conversation, though they haven't been able to make out the audio, and they've just said to you, hey, what are those two people talking about? So now you have to relay the overall meaning of what you've just listened to. What do you say? If you want, you can even pause now and try to say your answer aloud or write it down. But no watching the conversation back, after all it was only three minutes and you were paying close attention. So how hard could it be to summarize in a coherent manner? Can you do it? Our guess is no, which is no slight on you the viewer. Because the fact of the matter is, in spite of Ellis and Mac's constant expressions of wonder, there really isn't anything to paraphrase. Because over the course of that three minutes, Keith Raniere essentially said nothing. But his ramblings are a rather special kind of nothing, as you actually have to pay attention to notice the nothingness. When a person who is cognitively impaired rambles, we all immediately realise it for what it is, because their syntax is broken, and the thoughts they put forward are often nakedly bizarre, with one sentence not even being clearly related to the next. They're just, for lack of a more delicate word, crazy. There are a lot of disparaging labels that we can and will apply to Keith Raniere, but crazy certainly isn't one of them, and so his ramblings have a sort of paradoxical quality. They are aimless, yet calculated, nonsensical, yet coherent. Because when we contend he didn't say anything, we don't mean that in a literal sense. Technically the conversation can be summarised. Alison Mack wants Keith Raniere to explain his take on the nature of creativity. Raniere then expounds that while in some ways science and creativity could be said to be opposites, in other ways they are also linked. While transitioning to his explanation of this, he briefly asserts that the notion of human free will is quote, inherent in science, and name drops Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. He then states that his point is essentially that predictability is the opposite of creativity. So free will equals not predictable equals creativity, basically. Then he muses over whether or not human beings really do have free will, or whether that may just be an illusion, as we cannot observe our own quote, programming, a concept in philosophy known as determinism. He concludes that if we were to find that free will did not exist, this would end the notion of creativity as we know it. No free will equals total predictability equals no creativity basically. Without really putting a finer point on the importance of all of this, Ranieri then begins talking about how we sometimes use creativity as an excuse, sort of like pointless originality. We cut the one and a half hour conversation short before he could unpack that much more, because we can only subject you to so much. But you get the point. It's not that what Ranieri is saying does not, strictly speaking, make sense. He is speaking in plain English, and all of the words are in the right order so as to form discernible thoughts. It's just that those thoughts provide absolutely no insight into the human experience, or anything else for that matter, whatsoever. But when Ranieri's empty words are spoken with the sort of knowing patter he's mastered, combined with his semi-casual yet professorial appearance, and the added benefit of an attractive young woman sitting across from him who seems to be hanging on to his every word, an illusion is created that what he is saying may be deeply profound. It's an illusion that many sociopathic cult leaders like Keith Raniere become adept at creating. Rather than actually providing genuinely deep insights, they instead present a sort of blank canvas that devoted followers then take imaginary paradigm-shifting lessons and sometimes the very meaning of life from. You can literally watch that process in real time in this video, as Ellis and Mac is not just a co-conspirator in the scam, though she certainly is that also, but a genuine true believer in the utter bullshit being spouted at her. One would say authenticity is being as you are and expressing as you are, at least to some degree. Mm -hmm. And as you are is of course the sum of your whole past. So when someone's being authentic, you get the feeling that not only that there's a person there in the moment, but somehow you, you reach into their very essence and you, you meet a unique individual. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that makes me want to cry. <laughs> it's beautiful. So who is Alison Mack, and how did she find herself in a place where the sort of drivel she just heard would make her want to cry?
Well, her story is both sensational and mundane, and in order to better understand it, it's crucial to explain how people are drawn into cults in general. Before we get into that, we should quickly outline what a cult is. That's a question that's been subject to quite a lot of debate over the years, but for the purpose of this video, a cult is defined as a group, either religious or secular, that endeavours to recruit individuals, indoctrinate them into the group's worldview, and subsequently exert control over their lifestyle, relationships and finances. While this definition may not be perfect, it should serve to capture the sorts of groups that come to most people's minds when they think of the word cult, as well as exclude groups that are sometimes controversially branded as cults, but can be plausibly argued to be relatively benign. Now while there is no absolute cookie cutter profile for the sort of person who is drawn into a cult, there is about as close to one as possible for the sort of person who is not. Imagine someone raised in a stable household who finds a fulfilling pursuit in life, leading to steady employment that allows them to support themselves, as well as the people they love, who love them in turn. The person you just pictured is very unlikely to wind up moving to a remote compound, handing over their life savings to a man who claims to channel the spirit of an ancient healer named Sansu, and going on to chant mantras in a made up language for just about every waking hour of the day, until several years later when the compound is raided by federal authorities responding to multiple reports of sex abuse. At this point you might feel like we've just prescribed a cult avoidance strategy of just be perfect. But if you look closely at the profile we gave, there's no circumstance or attribute we assigned our hypothetical cultiverse individual that's all that remarkable. The upbringing we gave them was merely stable, the nature of their employment just steady, and they had love. There's enough in there for many to envy unfortunately, but we're not talking pie in the sky life aspirations here. Now take note of some desirable attributes that did not make it into the profile. We never mentioned physical attractiveness, fitness or riches, fame and even power didn't make the cut, nor did intelligence or higher education. The sorts of people who are recruited into cults, often on a surface level and in actuality, have a lot going for them, but they also just about invariably have some kind of void to fill. They might have had a bad breakup and be dealing with feelings of rejection and a fear of never being able to find someone else. They might have suddenly lost a job and be dealing with the dread of an uncertain future. They might be someone who doesn't have one specific crisis moment to point to, but has found themselves in a place where they just don't see the meaning in it all, and desperately want to find their place in the world. Put more simply, they are yearning to be happy. Which brings us to the question of intelligence. When you look at cult members in their final, fully indoctrinated form, it's easy to think of them as being stupid or extremely gullible, and this video contends that the vast majority of cult recruitees are in fact gullible. But unlike intelligence, gullibility is not necessarily an innate quality, and when an intelligent person finds themselves in a place where they're yearning to be happy, it is remarkable just how gullible they can be. And so once a cult has found their mark, the next step in the indoctrination process is to provide a first fix, a feeling of release or elation, but one that is fleeting. There is no magic pill for eternal happiness, but if there was, it would be of no use to a cult, as it wouldn't provide much of an incentive for people to come back or stick around. There are all kinds of methods for delivering a first fix, but one of the more vividly illustrative ones can be found in the Church of Scientology, an extremely controversial religion founded in 1954 by science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard. I wondered, Mr. Hubbard, if you could explain simply to a layman what Scientology is. I think that'd be a relatively easy idea because it's actually a subject which is designed for the layman and if you couldn't explain it to the layman you would have a very difficult time of it. The subject of name means skio which means knowing how to know in the fullest sense of the word ology which is study of so it is actually study of knowingness that is what the word itself means. The to me, yeah. to me that doesn't mean very much. I didn't understand that. I mean, what does it do for you, in theory? It increases one's knowingness. 
But if a man were totally aware of what was going on around him, he would find it relatively simple to handle any outnesses in that. Even after three hours of talking, we never got an explanation from him that we could understand. And we won't waste any time trying to convey what Scientology is in a manner that can be understood. Because for this video it's beside the point when it comes to one of their key mechanisms of recruitment. Scientology is by far the most successful and widespread organization profiled in this video. And so there are all sorts of ways a given person might be introduced to the church. It could be through a friend, a person handing out pamphlets on the street, or even by finding themselves in one of the many Scientology-run drug rehab clinics throughout the world. Like any successful cult, they're adept at putting themselves in close proximity to the vulnerable. Regardless of how you come into contact with the church, one of the first things you'll find yourself doing if you agree to give their way of life a try is sitting down for an auditing session. Scientology's mechanism for delivering a first fix. Auditing is a relatively simple if not odd looking procedure. It almost always involves the use of a device called an e-meter, a machine hooked up to two cylindrical electrodes held by the subject being audited that Scientologists claim measures the quote mental mass and energy of the subject, assisting the auditor in monitoring their progress. The following scripted training video that explains the method and purported benefits of auditing, for whatever reason, omits the e-meter, which funnily enough is appropriate as there's no scientific evidence the device actually does anything more than register changes in the electrical conductance of the skin, so its absence won't do anything to detract from the illustration of what people are supposed to get out of the exercise. In auditing, the person running the session is called the auditor. The person receiving auditing is called a preclear because he has not yet been cleared of his reactive mind. The auditor assures the preclear that he will know everything that happens. We will begin the session now. You will remain aware of everything which goes on. Have the preclear close his eyes. All right, close your eyes. The auditor has to ensure that anything said or done during the session will have no force or control over the preclear at a later time after the session. In the future, when I utter the word canceled, Everything that I have said to you while you're in a therapy session will be cancelled and will have no force with you. The auditor has to locate and return the preclear to an incident. Locate an incident that you feel you can comfortably face. Okay. Now we come to the fifth step. Having the preclear re-experience the incident from beginning to end, telling the auditor about it as he goes along. Go through the incident and say what is happening as you go along. I'm in a meeting. And I'm, I'm just feeling stressed out. Uh, the preclear has returned to the incident, going through it as it is happening, not simply remembering it. Um, I just feel tired, like I need to go lie down, and so I excuse myself from the meeting. Have the preclear go back to the beginning of the incident again. Each time the preclear goes through the incident, its negative influence over him is reduced. Go back to the beginning and go over it. Pick up whatever additional data you can contact. The auditor is listening for new information coming out of the incident. As long as new data is coming out, the incident is reducing. Oh yeah, an ambulance drives by outside and the, the guy, one of the guys goes up to, to close the window and I remember thinking to myself, I'm, I'm so tired, I just, my eyes are so tired, it's like I can't see. Continue to run the incident until the preclear is cheerful about it. When the preclear is cheerful about running that incident, have the preclear locate another incident that he can comfortably face. Let's find another incident that you feel you can comfortably face. The time I broke up with my girlfriend. To this day, I do not understand why I did that. Audit this new incident by continuing the procedure with step 5, followed by step 6A. Go through the incident and say what's happening as you go along. Well, it started out great. I mean, I went to pick her up at her house for dinner and it was pouring rain. Run the preclear through the incident as many times as it takes to bring the preclear to the point where he is cheerful about it. And uh, I remember we started driving and some guy runs out into the middle of the road. I, I almost hit him. And uh, I just started to feel really stressed out. It's the same thing. I'm thinking to myself, this relationship is getting too serious. And life is too short. If the preclear does not seem to be able to uncover any more about an incident, then find out from the preclear if there is an earlier incident, 
similar to the one you were auditing. Is there an earlier incident similar to the one we are auditing? Uh, uh, yeah, there is. Um, my accident. Go through the incident and say what is happening as you go along. I'm driving home. I'm coming home from a business trip. It's late. Uh, I'm tired. There's a storm brewing up ahead. There's thunder and lightning. And then a newspaper comes from out of the blue and lands on my windshield. I, I, I can't see. And by the time it blows off, I'm heading straight for a tree. As long as new data is still coming out of the incident, the auditor needs to continue to run the incident using steps 5 and 6A. What do you hear? I hear a hissing sound. Uh, I guess that's the, the steam from the radiator. Good. Continue. There's blood coming down my face. I can hear a car going by and someone says, oh my god. Oh my god. And um, something about getting an ambulance. I can hear the door chime going dung, dung, dung. I guess the, the door, I, I open the door. Yeah, I opened, just before I blacked out, I tried to open that door, but I, I couldn't get out. And then they got me out. They got me out. They got me onto a stretcher. Yeah. Someone starts talking. I, uh... God, my head is throbbing. Um... Someone says something. Yeah. Stress is killing me. Uh... This, this stress is killing me. They're talking. One of them's talking about... The dropping his girlfriend. Well, you know, life is short, you know? <laughs> life is short, that's... That's what, I, that's what I said to my girlfriend when I broke up with her, that's... But that wasn't... That wasn't me, I didn't want to break up with my girlfriend. And, and the stress is killing me, that's something that I always say, but that... <laughs> that was those two guys in the ambulance. This is the end of the auditing session. The preclear is bright, cheerful, and the engram has erased. This is a good time to end off for today since he's really doing well. You don't want to continue the session if the preclear has had a win. Always end on a high note. So what the hell did we just watch? Well, first of all, a scripted video that naturally depicts an absolute ideal for how the Church of Scientology would want an auditing session to be portrayed. Most sessions don't actually result in the subject recovering memories that miraculously explain decisions they regret or what have you. But in the main, what the video demonstrates is a form of exposure therapy, dressed up with unnecessary jargon and additional steps to make it seem like an original invention. The idea is that an unpleasant memory can only be so unpleasant for so long a stretch of time before the emotional impact of it begins to diminish, at least for the time being. So an auditor sits you down and has you recall an unpleasant incident. But always an unpleasant incident. That you feel you can comfortably face. Not something so unpleasant it might actually make you a wreck. They don't want you running away. So you talk through this memory that's been bothering you once. Then again, recalling any details you might have left out. Then again, and again, and again, and again, until you basically don't have the emotional energy to even care about it anymore. Put like that, it sounds rather mundane, which it is. But from your perspective in the moment, something that's been bothering you has all of a sudden been rendered totally insignificant. You feel like a weight has been lifted off your shoulders, and you start to think that maybe these people might be on to something. Over time, once the repetition-induced numbness has worn off, the memory might start to bother you again. But that's just a sign you're not truly clear yet, and need more auditing. It might sound like a scam to your friends and family, but you know that technology works, because you experienced it yourself. And at this point, basically they've got you, so the next thing they need to worry about is retention. Like any cult, or even mainstream religion for that matter, Scientology has some turnover, with members periodically becoming disillusioned one way or another before leaving the flock. One of the most effective ways to curtail a cult's exit rate is to manage the pace of indoctrination, introducing recruits to some of the group's more colourful teachings, only after a period of time where they're deemed to be sufficiently invested to accept said teachings. Put another way, save the really crazy shit for later. Bruce, what is OT3? It's basically a type of exorcism. You are removing from your body or attached to you in some way spiritual beings that are stuck there. And they're stuck there 
because of an incident that happened 75 million years ago. There was a place that, that, that looked like Earth and these people were packaged up by this, this crazy galactic leader, Xenu. Boxed them up in boxes, threw them into space planes, and they took these people, and they dumped them, and then they set off hydrogen bombs on the top of each primary volcano. And that those people that were blown up are now what composes and makes up our bodies, right? Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. But well, we all did it. <laughs> Leah Rimini isn't the only former Scientologist to cite the revelations of OT Level 3 and the intergalactic warlord Xenu as a turning point in the way they viewed Scientology overall, so it makes sense the church keeps such things close to their chest. It's been claimed as little as 5% of church members even reach OT Level 3, and those that do make it are taught that premature exposure to the information can cause some to be inflicted with illnesses such as pneumonia and even cancer. As evidenced by people like Remini, even keeping the material that guarded isn't enough to eliminate incertitude. But that's only half the point behind why cults often withhold their most extreme tenets from the attention of members until much later down the line after they sign up. The other vital benefit of this approach is that by the time a member reaches OT Level 3, they will be invested in the church in ways that transcend belief in its teachings. Cults have a way of slowly encouraging more and more isolation from influences outside of them. Over a period of years, if you've gradually built more or less your entire social circle around the church, perhaps met an intimate partner through it, and even raised children in it, well, they could sit you in a room and tell you your great-grandma was Xenu and you'd have a lot of reason to go along with it. To not would be to leave the church, which would effectively be to throw away your entire life. Beyond material consequences, when a person has been emotionally invested in a cult for long enough, a profound sunk cost fallacy is liable to be instilled in their psyche. The idea that one really invested years, sometimes even decades of their life, into what is essentially no more than a regimen of watered-down talk therapy, with a top-secret piece of mediocre sci-fi behind it, is just too bitter of a pill for many to swallow. And once someone is far enough down the rabbit hole of a cult, they can reach a point of no turning back with a follow through on their bizarre beliefs is both confounding and grave. Hello? Yes, um, I need to uh, report uh, an anonymous tip. Who do I talk to? Uh, okay, this is regarding what? And, uh, this is regarding a mass suicide, and I can give you the address. On March 26th of 1997, a shockwave went through international media upon the discovery of 39 bodies in a mansion in Rancho Santa Fe, California. The deceased were all found to have downed a lethal cocktail of phenobarbital and vodka, along with a serving of chocolate pudding. A few chose applesauce instead. Working in teams over the course of three days, one group would take the poisonous solution, fasten a plastic bag over their head in order to suffocate, and lie down in their assigned bunk bed. Their associates would then see to it that a purple cloth was draped over their face and torso for privacy, the final two of the 39 being denied that dignity for obvious reasons. The event was reported in the media as being a mass suicide, a characterization accepted by roughly 99.999% of people, but to the adherents of the teachings of Heaven's Gate is just one more misrepresentation of what they have come to know as reality. It is the belief of those people that while the human bodies found in that mansion may have died, this was just a necessary step to facilitate the transportation of the spirits held within to a spaceship trailing the comet Hale-Bopp that had that year become visible to the naked eye from planet Earth, an event they took as a sign that it was finally time for their departure to what they referred to as the evolutionary level above human in the literal heavens. The voluntary killing of their physical bodies was therefore no more a suicide than the booking of a plane ticket. What figure could be so well spoken and charismatic to convince dozens of people of such a proposition? This guy. We can't enter that kingdom by, and no one can enter that kingdom by trying to live a good life in this world, and then when this world's life takes your body, then that's when you enter. 
the only time that kingdom can be entered is when there's a member of that kingdom, member or members of that kingdom, who have come into the human kingdom, incarnated as we have, and offer you, you clarification of that information, and then help you get your mind into your body, so that when, it, when the time comes to leave, then we help you also get out of your human body so that you might enter a body of the next evolutionary kingdom. His name is Marshall Applewhite, though his followers know him as Doe, and maintain he has visited planet Earth on several occasions prior to the 20th century as a representative of the evolutionary level above human, through vessels you may know as Jesus, Elijah, Moses, Enoch, and Adam. Though on this visit, he was not sent to serve alone. You might wonder why this chair is as prominent as it is in the picture beside me, and this chair represents my partner. So this is T's chair, and this is, uh, I hope that T occupies this chair many times that, that I might not be up, even though I might not be able to see T. But still I'm uncomfortable if I am the center of attention without a reminder to me and to my students that my partner is with me, beside me, and uh, since T is in the next level and no longer occupying a human vehicle, then sometimes when I ask T questions I may not get an immediate answer and I might get an answer a little later, I may get an answer days later or months later depending upon the question. Sometimes I may not get an answer at all if the answer was inappropriate. The T that Applewhite refers to is a woman named Bonnie Nettles. She co-founded Heaven's Gate with Applewhite in the 70s, though it wasn't called Heaven's Gate at the time, and there were some rather notable differences to their prophecies of a coming ascension to the next level as well. When they were actively touring the nation recruiting people into their group, there was no talk of an eventual need to kill your physical body in order to make the trip. Rather, T and Doe promised that a spacecraft would come down to Earth, very much visible to those that did not adhere to the teachings of Heaven's Gate, and transport those who had been spiritually awake enough to see the truth up to the next level where they belonged. So unlike the small stepping recruitment strategy we've covered of not putting the crazy stuff up front, Heaven's Gate took more of a niche approach, focusing on those who had a, let's just say, particularly open mind. And the shift from the externally verifiable spaceship to the phenobarbital as a means of transportation to the next level was not as far as we can observe part of a sinister long con either. From their words and actions over the years, it appears that T and Doe were indeed true believers. But their theology ran into a problem when Bonnie Nettles fell victim to cancer, dying of the disease in 1985. One of their leader's bodies dying in such a typical human manner put a bit of a dampener on the notion of a physical spacecraft taking the whole group together. But the meat of T and Doe's teachings were still on point as far as Heaven's Gate were concerned. T had simply fulfilled all purpose that she could have on Earth and was recalled to the next level. No longer needing her physical vehicle, it was essentially discarded via the cancer. Doe, on the other hand, still had stuff to do. The death of Bonnie Nettles, therefore, is seen by many as being one of the leading catalysts for what we're watching right now. With the approach of Hale Bob, the Heaven's Gate away team had been given the sign that their physical bodies too must perish as part of their key to unlocking Heaven's Gate. Suicide is separating from the Kingdom of God when the Kingdom of God has reached out and offered life to you. That is suicide. So to us, it would be suicide to not leave much of the, of the life, vegetation, everything of the planet is about to be recycled because it needs to be refurbished. It'll be a miracle if this tape ever is permitted to become knowledge that could spread across the world to even give individuals a chance to know what we have to say about what you might have been offered or what you might even still be offered if this connects with you. I want you to see the class that's sitting in front of me. And uh, I'm very proud of these 
students of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God, of the evolutionary level above human. They're about to leave and they're excited about leaving. Now, if you would uh, hold your patch, maybe we can zoom in on the patch that, great. See, uh, turn it the other way a little bit. If you know the opposite way a little bit. There you go. Now we don't have, there we go. See, it says heaven's gate awaiting. And that's exactly what that means to us. We've been away and now we're going back. Okay, go back to Jim Odie, <coughs> if you would. Okay, thanks Jim Odie. Now let's go to Dave Odie. <laughs> Hi Dave Odie, look at the camera, you look great. Okay, now let's go to Al Odie. In case you were wondering, the members of Heaven's Gate do not just all coincidentally have uncommon names ending in Odi. All were assigned new names beginning with two to three letters that were unique to each member and ending with ODY. Sociologists cite this as a mechanism of brainwashing, cementing a member's psychological isolation from the rest of society by taking their given name and replacing it with a uniform identity that conforms with the cult. According to Heaven's Gate, Odi is just a suffix for a child of the next level. Okay, and then there's Tall Odi next to him. We call him Tall Odi because he's he's a little taller than Lagodi, who happens to be very, very tall. <laughs> and we've had a lot of fun teasing him. Uh, he was what you just heard was a slip-up that diverged enough from Heaven's Gate doctrine for Applewhite to feel the need to correct himself in a separate recording. I realized when I was talking about the classmates and the camera was on them individually after I spoke to you last evening that I caught myself a number of times realizing I had spoken of the vehicle that they were wearing as them and I, I was very uncomfortable realizing I had done that because that's something we work hard to try to break the habit of because we know that the body is not us. We we took the body uh, when the body was even mature and now we're going to leave the body. But I remember when I spoke to you about tall Odie and I said uh, because he's so tall or I, I think I might have said that instead of always remembering to say because his vehicle is so tall. It's an illuminating mistake because it isn't one that you would be prone to making if the nature of being Applewhite just described was literally true. Take the example of an actual vehicle, for instance. Say you saw Marshall Applewhite driving a Hummer. You would say Marshall's car is big, never Marshall is big. And more importantly, you would not need to make a conscious effort to say the right thing. Describing people as being separate from their vehicles comes naturally to you, because it's just reality. But incongruities like this don't seem to unsettle members of Heaven's Gate one iota. And this is the most significant factor that makes this cult such a fascinating case study. With many cults, you can see cracks showing in some adherents now and again. The members of Heaven's Gate, all indoctrinated in adulthood, show no signs of any such misgivings in their exit interviews. Every person that you're about to see here is fully aware that they'll be taking the lethal cocktail in a matter of days. You've probably heard of the news media story in 75 about a bunch of people disappearing from Walport, Oregon. Well, we're still here <laughs> and not belong. I'm here and I'm very, very happy here. I don't know what I did to deserve to be here and I'm embarrassed that I can't express uh, without getting emotional uh, how good I feel about what I'm doing and how good I feel about being here. I just want to say how thankful I am to Doe and T for helping me and taking me under their wing and showing me the ways of the next level and all my classmates have been so great to me and all the problems I've caused. This particular vehicle that I'm using, I know it had a deposit in it because from the time it was just a little kid, it looked around and observed what it was seeing around it and it felt like something was missing. There was nothing significant to what it saw the adults doing and the lives it saw going on around it. Tiendo said that they had a formula of how to get out of the human kingdom to a level above human. And I said to myself, that's what I want. 
That's what I've been looking for. I don't care if this is some, um, you know, maybe they're crazy for all I know, but I don't have any choice but to go for it because I've been on this planet for 31 years and there's nothing here for me. The moment I saw them, I just, uh, at, at first I think the vehicle was frightened that the mind that was coming into this vehicle recognized them and, and beyond a shadow of a doubt, I knew what I had to do. Well, this vehicle knew it didn't fit in this world, but after I met my older members, saw them through these eyes, heard them through these ears, I knew where I belonged. I recognized them. The little people I had been looking for had come to take me home. I'm one who left the class after having been in it for six years and returned into the world. It's up to each individual to prove to the next level that, that the next level is all that they want and that there's nothing in the human kingdom to hold them here. Those who might have recognized the next level but turned away may, from it for one reason or another, anywhere, whether in a meeting or having been with us, they may need to plead repeatedly like I did over a long period of time to show that they're sincere. But if you knock on the door and continue asking to serve the next level, they won't forsake you. I don't know if you remember Doe talking about that some students had chosen, had proven to him that they desired to have their vehicles neutered. And I'm one of those students that did that. And I can't tell you how free that has made me feel. In all reality, I can't see that this next step that I'm prepared to take and am looking forward to taking is anything more than a clinical operation. I can't see any other way but to fully expect that laying down this vehicle is going to be anything but great for me. I did want to recommend on our website, um, we have a picture of what we feel like a member of the next level might look like. We don't know if it's entirely accurate, but we feel like because of the way Doe helped bring that picture about and that he feels so good about it, that it must be very close to what we're looking forward to being in in our next level bodies. Now you're going to find this old crummy vehicle in a bunk someplace that I'll be going, I'll probably be watching when you, when you check it out and, and observe your responses and your reaction when you look at these vehicles. And, they're all nothing but containers that we've used and bored for the short amount of time. Well, as a quote monastery, we've had a little business that we call Higher Source, from which we earned our income so we could consume while we were on this planet. And there have been more than one client who has suspected that there was a little something unusual about us. And um, one particular individual came up to us one day and said something like, I'm halfway expecting one of these days that you're going to come through the door and say something like, the big guy upstairs sent us, you know, to work with you. To that individual, I'd like to say at this time that God did have a message for you, but it was a bit premature when you asked. <laughs> and we'd like to let you know that uh, he's had an eye on you. And one last thing we'd like to say is, 39 to beam up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
this was going to happen. And that's what actually T and Do explained to us later. It ended up being that 34 individuals out of that meeting of approximately 200 or so, I ended up joining with T and Do because of that meeting. It's like a light switch going off, you know, okay. uh, but there wasn't any sound or anything with it or you know, I, I didn't see any flashes in the, you know, in the sky or visions or anything. It was just, I felt like uh, my life, I did feel like my life flashed in front of my eyes as being, leading me to this moment to where I had that choice and that I had no question about that this was the right thing for me to do. Assuming such descriptions are not just backwards rationalizations of a moment, that in actuality felt more mundane at the time, there does not exist a simple and demonstrable explanation for how Applewhite and Nettles were able to induce these sorts of experiences in people. Please don't take that as this video's way of saying maybe there really was a spaceship, it's just that while we are endeavouring to bring as much clarity to the sorts of psychological mechanisms that underlie cults as we can, it has to be acknowledged that in some ways people are just very strange, and not everything about precisely what drives certain experiences and beliefs is known. So what exactly made people sign up, even though Heaven's Gate were bold enough to put their Xenu story up front, remains somewhat of a mystery. In terms of what solidified their commitment to the cause, that we can shed some light on. On their website, Heaven's Gate presents behavioural guidelines for students of their classroom. It reads like a quintessential brainwashing regimen. They have a succinct list of what they deem to be major offences, knowingly disobeying instructions, allowing any prolonged actions or thoughts of quote, sensuality. Heaven's Gate is a strictly asexual cult, mating is not part of how the next level operates, so engaging in anything like sex is a serious impediment to graduation. And at the very top of the list is deceit of any kind specifically name-checking a failure to confess for even as long as one day, the commission of another offence, either major or lesser. Among Heaven's Gate's lesser offences? Trusting your own judgement, responding defensively to classmates or teachers, having likes or dislikes, desiring attention or approval, exercising poor control of thoughts running through your head, vibrating femininity, or masculinity in any way and having inappropriate curiosity. In short, Applewhite and Nettles constructed an environment in which individuality and critical thinking were systematically stomped out. At any hour of any day, if you so much as dare to daydream, you must report the offence as soon as possible lest you commit the greatest offence of deceit. It is about as extreme an example of thought control as you'll ever find. And if the people overseeing such a program are teaching you that your spirit is going to be transported to a spaceship, you're going to be very likely to believe that with every fibre of your being after enough time sticking to the program. Yes, the certainty of the away team and their exit interviews looks crazy, but when you take into account just how thoroughly they've been conditioned to not allow contradicting thoughts in, perhaps it would be crazy for their level of conviction to be anything less than 100%. And this is a crucial point when it comes to understanding cults in the main. The outwardly bizarre stuff like intergalactic theologies is often what grabs our attention, but it's the mechanisms of thought control that we often don't see that are truly at the heart of what makes the behaviour and choices of cult members that seem so baffling to us normal to them. Even teachings of a higher power or equivalent to heaven aren't necessary if the cult leader has the right game plan in place to slowly take control of the thoughts and actions of recruits. Well, the biggest limitation that women have is that they're women. Yes. And the biggest limitation that men have is that they're men. Don't think we forgot about these two. It was mentioned at the beginning of this video that not all people who are captured by cults are facing what pretty much anyone would characterise as a period of crisis and seem to have a lot going for them. Alison Mack is a prime example of this. Not only was she a young, attractive woman, she had also attained something that many others fortunate enough to have those attributes fail to, a successful acting career. Most notable for her role as Chloe Sullivan on the hit TV series Smallville. But success and fulfilment are very distinct from one another. Like anyone, 
Ellis and Mac had insecurities, stemming from a number of sources, such as having never attended college as a consequence of taking the Smallville role at the age of 18, and so she found herself in a headspace many young people with early success experience, a sense that she had it all, yet so much was missing. She wanted deeper meaning in her life, and so naturally she found herself attending a self-help seminar, Specifically, one run by a group called Janus that billed itself as quote, a woman's movement that facilitates an ongoing exploration of what it means to be a woman. Janus was a subgroup of a larger self-help organization named Nexium, which was founded and run by this guy. If these people become affiliates, what are they going to do on the average? 2.6. Right. They're going to at least, at least, at least do this. So what's going to happen on the average with this structure? Perpetuate. It's going to perpetuate, right. This is a younger Keith Raniere, pitching a multi-level marketing company he cooked up in the 90s called Consumers Byline. It didn't last long, being shut down in 96 after the powers that be determined it was an obvious pyramid scheme. It's interesting that Keith Raniere was passionate about multi-level marketing from such a young age, as various MLM companies have themselves been accused of being cults or utilizing cult-like tactics to keep their contractors pitching their products door-to-door -door on a commission-only basis, even after a livable income hasn't materialized after months or even years. It makes sense then that Raniere's next venture, Nexium, was in fact another multi-level marketing company. Except this time, it was disguised as a self-improvement support group rather than a sales force. The basic structure of the company went like this. A person looking to overcome whatever obstacle in life you'd like to name signs up for one of Nexium's multi-thousand dollar workshops, often after having its virtues extolled to them by a friend or colleague. Upon attending the seminar, this person actually finds they get quite a lot out of it after they run through exercises such as an exploration of meaning or EM, that funnily enough bears a striking resemblance to a Scientology auditing session. In an EM, a senior member of Nexium has a subject explore areas of stress in their life and then moves on to quizzing them about whether any traumatic memories may be connected to such stress. Unlike in Scientology though, an EM session has an audience. Discussing traumatic memories in front of a conference room full of people may sound invasive, and it is, but fellow participants are instructed to applaud whenever the subject has a breakthrough, causing discomfort to transform into validation, a euphoric experience that makes for an excellent first fix. But just like Scientology, at Nexium it's not just a matter of thanks for coming, glad we could help. There's always more issues to work on, technology to learn, and courses to buy. With the price tags of courses starting at just south of $3,000, you might think the prospect of regular return visits would be financially impossible for most, but by selling courses to other people, you can actually make money from transforming your life, potentially even turn it into a full-time job. This is all no doubt shady, but unfortunately not completely unique in the world of self-help. Remember though, when trying to build a cult of more than just dozens of people, it's best to save the crazy stuff for later. Upon attending her first JNS seminar, Ellis and Mac was intrigued by the teachings and the prospect of finding that deeper meaning in life that she had been longing for, so she jumped at the opportunity to meet the man who all of this wisdom originated from. Keith Raniere was treated as somewhat of a demigod with a Nexium, and face-to-face -face time with him wasn't typically something someone received right out the gate. However, Ellis and Mac's celebrity status would make her a big get, so it's not exactly surprising that she got to cut in line. Their first meeting was actually captured on video, and it's something to behold. The impressionable Mac has clearly already bought into the notion that Ranieri might be the man who holds all the answers, and a topic they broach during the conversation is Mac's love of art. When I go to see a, a film or mm. a piece of artwork or mm. something happens to me, I'm so excited and one blissful, joyful. One thing many cult leaders are adept at is turning benign or even outright positive aspects of a person's life into problems that need to be worked on. If you feel that art is necessary for that, that's almost a self-condemnation. Just like we saw at the start, 
absolute gobbledygook. Some people have spoken of Ranieri as a sort of evil genius, and while we would never dispute that the man is certainly a well-practiced manipulator, it's important to not give people like this too much credit, because the vast majority of people who came into contact with Ranieri had no problem seeing his pseudo-philosophical babbling for exactly what it was. Hypnotists sometimes say that the key is finding someone who wants to be hypnotized. So when you watch Mac begin to well up as if she's just received some kind of life-changing insight, you're not witnessing someone under the spell of a master brainwasher. She's already bought into the notion of Keith Raniere as a super guru. All he needs to do is play the part. After that, she will more or less take care of the rest. I'm used to that self-condemnation. <laughs> I'm comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. If I let go of that belief, mm -hmm. that it's not the art that's giving me this feeling, it's me that's giving me this feeling, then I have to trust that I will be capable of giving myself that feeling. Will you give me an ear? Um, not right now, but at some point. And that is often what you'll witness when someone is caught by a cult hook, line, and sinker. They reel themselves in. From that point, Ellis and Mac went on to become one of Nexium's most visible spokespeople and highest ranking members, helping to recruit, run various seminars, mentor fellow members, and even lead a Nexium a cappella group, Simply Human. Dun, 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 dun. You can say I told you so. Because hey, why the hell not? And really at this point from what we've covered, if you've never stumbled upon the Nexium story before, why the hell not could be your overriding takeaway. Yes, self-improvement groups like Nexium are pretentious at best, and predatory at worst when considering the amount of money they bleed people out of, with their promises of self-actualization and the like. But they're also nothing new, and ultimately not all that hard to walk away from. There's a decent chance that you or someone you know has been caught up in one of them. A regrettable experience maybe, but hardly traumatizing, and maybe even genuinely beneficial in some ways, even if not as life-changing as what was promised. But of course if Nexium was that benign, they wouldn't be in this video. So let's move the timeline forward just a touch. Alison Mack sentenced to three years behind bars and a $20,000 fine for her role in the Nexium sex cult. Its leader, Keith Ranieri, was sentenced to 120 years in prison in October for his role that included sex trafficking women. The group founded in Albany, New York by Ranieri was marketed as a self-help organization, but former members say Mack helped recruit women to a secret sub-society within Nexium called DOS or The Vow. The women had to give over collateral, like compromising photos and videos, in order to join. Members were then organized in levels as masters and slaves. Some women in DOS say they were branded with Ranieri and Max initials, and other former members say they were also coerced into having sexual relations with Ranieri. Nexium victim Jessica Joan flew from the West Coast to Brooklyn to deliver an angrily worded impact statement in which she labeled Allison Mack a monster cut from the same cloth as Keith Ranieri, and she said there aren't enough years in the rest of her life to make up for the harm, pain, and suffering she caused. Allison Mack, she asserted, is an evil sociopath and a menace to society. You might feel like we skipped a big chunk in terms of explaining how exactly the self-help seminars escalated to the harem of sex slaves being branded with a cauterizing pen. And we sort of did, but sort of didn't. Because it's one of those things that doesn't necessarily make a whole lot more sense the more it's explained. Conditioning is like that. It's hard to understand without actually experiencing each step of the slow burn yourself. Going to the self-help seminar and getting that first fix. Meeting people you feel a connection with, look up to and trust. Having one of those people tell you about this exclusive inner circle group that will really take your self-improvement journey to the next level. Being convinced to hand over damaging information for admittance because it's the only way to really make the program real. 
beginning to realize just how deep you're really into this thing when that person starts insisting you text them for permission to eat before every meal as part of a 900 calorie a day diet plan. Ranieri liked his woman thin, feeling like you can no longer bail out for fear your collateral will be released, or worse, convincing yourself that this really was a good idea to begin with, if for no other reason than to cope. And finally, recruiting slaves of your own, graduating from victim to perpetrator. This video began by outlining how so many can be vulnerable to cults, so it feels appropriate to end with the best words of advice we can offer on how to avoid being captured by one. There are all kinds of cults, and they vary in many ways. Some are religious, some are secular. Some conceal their weirdness, others let it all hang out. Some know they're a scam, others really buy what they're selling. One very common thread, however, is this. An implicit or explicit proposition that you're in some way broken and in need of fixing. That if you're in a bad place now, or even just some of the time, it doesn't have to be like that ever again. You know, you can practice generating an extreme feeling of joy over anything. <laughs> but here's the thing. You're not actually supposed to feel happy all the time. Going through periods of melancholy and even feeling like you're struggling to see the point of everything is, within reason, normal and healthy. Life is always going to have ups and downs, so there's no need to feel like you're failing at it whenever you find yourself in one of the down parts. Hopefully it goes without saying that there are limits to those words of advice. If you're experiencing something like chronic and severe depression, please seek help. And in any event, we're not encouraging an approach of just wait it out. Being proactive in trying to find ways to turn things around during a rough patch is great, as is finding a support network of some kind, even one that could be characterized as a self-help program. Just make sure you do your research first, especially if you're dealing with a for-profit company. But if a person or group seems to be suggesting that they don't just offer help, but rather the solution, a way of life or destination that you can travel to that will result in you never going through a rough patch or feeling unhappy for a period ever again, that's when you need to run for the hills. Because it's following those sorts of people that will have you winding up in a dark room reading about ancient alien warlords, being held down on a table while the initials of some actress and pseudo-intellectual dork are carved into your skin, found dead among dozens of other corpses sporting identical uniforms and pixie haircuts, or God forbid, singing in an a cappella group. <laughs> I'm only flesh and blood. But I can be anything that you demand. I could be queen of everything. I'm just a tiny little grain of sand. 